aperture. Hello, thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Michael Famigetti. I'm the editor of Aperture Magazine. For those of you who are not familiar with Aperture, we were founded in 1952 by a group of artists, writers, and curators as common ground for photography. Aperture today is a multi-platform publisher that unites the photography community in print, in person, and online. Tonight's program is the second event in our series celebrating the Utopia issue of the magazine. In this issue, photographers and writers envision a world without prisons, document visionary architecture, honor queer space and creativity, and dream of liberty through spiritual self-expression. They show us that utopia is not necessarily a far-fetched scheme, but rather a way of reconsidering the everyday. One of the key features in the issue is uh, an interview with the filmmaker Matt Wolf, who we're very pleased to have here tonight. For more than a decade, Wolf has won acclaim for his meticulously crafted documentaries that reveal lost histories through deep dives into media archives. His focus is often on radical outsiders whose projects range from the quixotic to the paranoiac. His first film, Wild Combination, a portrait of Arthur Russeller, Russell, is an exploration of the life and work of an avant-garde cellist and disco producer. While Recorder, the Marion Stokes Project, examines the fascinating obsession of its subject, who recorded live television news continuously from 1979 until her death in 2012. Wolf's latest film, Spaceship, Spaceship Earth, traces the activities of a counterculture collective known as the Synergists from the 1969 founding of a sustainable ranch in New Mexico through the 1991 launch of Biosphere 2, a staggeringly ambitious attempt to pave the way for human life on Mars and to learn about how to live more sustainably on Earth by building a completely self-enclosed ecosystem inside a glass pyramid in the Arizona desert. Tonight, Matt will discuss Spaceship Earth with Ava Diaz, a writer and art critic living in Rockaway Beach. Her writing has appeared in many magazines and journals such as Aperture, um, where we're happy to have Ava as a regular contributor, Art Forum, Art in America, Freeze, and many others. She's the author of the book, The Experimenters, Chance and Design at Black Mountain College, and recently completed a new book titled After Spaceship Earth. The book takes up artists' challenges to a privatized and highly surveilled future in outer space and how the space race and colonization can be reformulated as powerful means to readdress economic, gender, and racial inequality, as well as ecological injustices. I'm very excited to have Matt and Ava here for what I'm sure will be a fascinating conversation. Aperture is a not-for-profit publication, and I just wanna shout out to our sponsors. Um, the programming for this issue is presented in partnership with London-based fashion brand, JW Anderson and significant support of the magazine is provided by the Kanakia Foundation and by John Stryker and Slobodan Randulovich. Further generous support is provided in part by the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs and the New York State Council on the Arts. And the easiest way that you can help support Aperture is to subscribe to the magazine and you can find a special offer in um, the chat, there'll be a discount code, or you can buy an individual copy of the Utopia issue. Um, we will be taking Q, uh, questions, and there is a Q&A box um, at the bottom of your screen. So if you have any questions, please post them in there, and we will get to them at the end of the talk. Um, so now I will turn it over to you, Ava. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for your introduction. And I want to welcome you, our audience, and especially our guest, Matt Wolf, to tonight's discussion. Um, as Michael mentioned, um, uh, Matt has made several documentaries, which I won't list again, but we are here, of course, to talk about Spaceship Earth on the Biosphere 2 project. Um, so the film Spaceship Earth draws on volumes of archival footage of the Biosphere 2 endeavor and Matt's interviews with the surviving participants, um, but it seems galvanized above all by some naughty questions about uh, geoengineering, sustainability, climate change, and colonies on Earth and elsewhere, and those are topics that we'll talk about tonight. 
But before we jump into those, Matt, can you describe the origin of the project and why you wanted to make this documentary? Sure, and thank you for coming, everybody. Um, I am always trolling the internet, looking for story ideas, and um, you know, looking for archives, really, because most of my work is based in archives. And I came across one day on the internet um, a striking image of eight people in bright red jumpsuits, like the band Devo, standing in front of a glass pyramid. And I genuinely thought it was a cool still from a science fiction film, but quickly realized that it was real, that these were eight biospherians who lived inside this kind of emerald city uh, in the Arizona desert called Biosphere 2. And, and as soon as I recognized that many of these people were alive and hadn't told their story, I was very determined to gain access. So, um, you know, fast forward a few months, I'm at Synergia Ranch, which is the, the commune of the countercultural group that gave genesis to this project. And, um, you know, I was brought into this temperature controlled closet that had hundreds of 16 millimeter films and analog videotapes and thousands of images. And, you know, I like almost screamed, it's kind of a filmmaker's dream. The story that to me felt very prescient because of, you know, the ecological catastrophe that we're contending with and this kind of futurist project that um, was grappling with that. Um, but also, you know, with living subjects and rich archive, there was this unique opportunity to tell this story that actually spans half a century in a very present tense way because of the volume of archival footage. Um, not only from the synergists, that, that countercultural group, but also from um, one of the biospherians, Dr. Roy Walford, who shot, you know, hundreds of hours of video inside as well. So um, I'm going to just uh, show a short video clip. And this is the moment that the biospherians enter Biosphere 2 for their two-year enclosure. Um, and their first impressions inside the miniature world of their creation. I went into the wilderness area, which is the area that I was managing. And I rained, I turned the rain on. just to wash all the air, thinking, okay, let's just wash all this other stuff out of here and begin anew. The reality that it was just the eight of us in this amazing new world started to hit. You can think and think and think and think about, oh, I'm going away for two years, but just suddenly, wow, we're here. You know, we were pioneers. We were the first biospherians. There was also this pride. Hey, you've given us a new world to, you know, figure out how to live in, and we're going to grow up with this thing. We're going to take care of it. So um, I'm going to ask you some questions, Matt, but the audience, again, as uh, Michael had indicated, please contribute questions um, as we're speaking to the chat, and we'll leave some time to address those at the conclusion of the program. So um, as you'd mentioned, and some of the images, you'll show a couple images, um, photographs um, in a minute, but um, those images really show how the timeline of your film begins in the 1960s counterculture. And I'm particularly interested in its relationship to technology, which is an extremely fraught one. On the one hand, you have this kind of anti-urban hippie idealization of non-Western cultures, which at the time was really souped up with um, what was called appropriate tools like permaculture, geodesic domes, modern septic systems. And many people um, you know, associated that and was most propagated most famously by Stuart Brand who founded the Whole Earth Catalog. 
And so like Brand, these synergists, um, and John Allen was the kind of charismatic leader of this group, and they became the Biosphereans, they also wanted to yoke this, this kind of paradoxical vision of technology um, that's kind of become familiar to us from like the Silicon Valley rhetoric of like self-actualization and profit being like a social benefit. <laughs> so how did the Biospherians navigate these contradictions like of nature, technology, profit? Um, it really seems like they struggled in the film to reconcile this, you know, the 60s into the 90s, I guess, moment. Yeah, and I, I think I, I am really fascinated by that history that you just so eloquently sketched out. And, you know, Fred Turner's book From Counterculture to Cyberculture was a big um, touchstone for me while making the film. And, you know, the, the kind of prevailing narrative of Biosphere 2 is around it being this kind of spectacular failure as a scientific experiment. But to me, I saw a much kind of more epic cultural history that begins in the 60s. And um, in, in a sense shows how, um, you know, uh, the, the, the synergists in fact had a different model of the back to the land movement because they identified themselves explicitly as capitalists. Um, they wanted to do projects that were both ecologically and economically sustainable. And um, they ended up traveling around the world on a concrete ship that they built and began all of these projects uh, in all of the, you know, so-called biomes around the world, whether it was a hotel in Kathmandu or a rainforest in Puerto Rico, or, um, you know, an art space in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, so they were gather taking on the world piece by piece and gathering that knowledge and it all synthesized into this project of Biosphere 2. Um, and it was all backed ironically by a Texas oil scion named Ed Bass, who was a kind of angel investor for them. Um, who, to his benefit, was incredibly, you know, not, he was not risk adverse. And they conceived of Biosphere 2, which ended up being this $200 million project as a pilot for Mars colonization. Um, but also, as, as um, Michael said, or, or you said, it also was, in some senses, a, a kind of spectacular demonstration of sustainable living on Earth. Um, so there was this aspiration for Biosphere 2 to, in, in fact, be a 100-year experiment in which they would continue to evolve this system they had created um, until um, we were ready for Mars colonization. It's, it's just a wild kind of futurist premise. But of course, um, you know, Biosphere 2 became, um, you know, quite a controversy in the mainstream media and, and quite a spectacle, um, and largely because of the mismanagement of the representation of the project by its founders, but also, um, you know, um, when you get bigger as that capitalist ethos, bigger is better is not always the best for this group. So in a lot of ways, um, and we can unpack that further, this is a cautionary tale about, um, you know, big business and environmental idealism not being the best bedfellows. And, and in some ways, the failures of 60s idealism when they integrated with the aspirations of dot-com culture from the 90s. Yeah, one of the things that um, strikes me about the figures in this project and this is kind of continuing this Silicon Valley rhetoric is their unabashed vision of themselves as world builders. And it seems to me that a problem of this, I guess you could call it like the autogenetic notion of humans authoring nature in this case, is that we can geoengineer the earth to our needs. And so Biosphere exposes this paradox, I guess, of this position, particularly in the way that they refer to themselves and their project as a self-sustaining um, capsule architecture um, and not pointing out the kind of multitude of extrinsic elements and technologies that supported that like air conditioning or the massive tanks of natural gas that were housed um, you know, nearby to provide electricity, for example. So, but your film follows these participants into their contemporary lives where they sometimes are articulate their discomfort with the godlike attitudes of their, perhaps not their youth, but of the project's beginnings. So what was the most surprising conclusion you came to about this 50-year arc of Biosphere 2, beginning in the 60s and, and meeting these people, talking to them, and putting out the film in 2020? 
Yeah, I mean, to, to that point, I don't think the Biospherians necessarily um, identified what they were doing as an Eden type project with godlike powers. I, I tried to foreground that kind of biblical metaphor in terms of the filmmaking as well. Uh, with, you know, my editor, David Teague, found a shot of a snake crawling around on the ground and, and the Biosphere and Lay peeking through leaves like a, a, like a Latter-day Eve. But, um, you know, that, that's, you know, something I tried to bring out in the filmmaking was particularly to depict John Allen, the kind of gregarious countercultural figure as, as a kind of godlike um, persona who, you know, um, as, a, as a theater maker too, tried to, you know, um, stage this theatrical narrative that spiraled out of his control. And I think in, in some ways that's a, that's a critique of, of the, the kind of patriarchal countercultural figure of, of that generation um, and the male genius behind epic projects like this. But I do think um, there was less of a, a heady interpretation of what they were doing. I think it was um, a group of people who were not only artists, but adventurers and were up to experimenting on terms that were beyond science, even though they were engaged in, in rigorous scientific observation and measurement and experimentation. I think they were people who were interested in engaging in a human experiment. And, and even more broadly, I think the group of synergists who conceived of Biosphere 2 in a sense have been engaged in a lifetime experiment together. Um, and, and this book that, that frames the film, Mount Analog, uh, this kind of experimental book by um, Rene Dumas, it, it discusses a group of people who go on a voyage to an island that doesn't exist on a map. And I found that to be such a, a kind of poignant and, and compelling metaphor for this group is they were on an adventure to do something that had never been done before. They were, they were dead set on, on futurism and, and pursuing unprecedented projects. But of course, um, there's a lot of poignancy and, and unresolved um, sadness about the fate of their most epic project and, and the viability of an endeavor to go to a place that doesn't yet exist on a map. So in a sense, I was trying to bring those metaphors to the filmmaking, but that I think at the end of the day, it was about a group of people trying to do something that hadn't been done before because they were concerned about the state of Biosphere One, which is how they referred to planet Earth. Um, the Sinead just took their name um, and a lot of the influence um, of their thinking from Buckminster Fuller and synergy is actually a word that he coined, um, which very simply put is the great, the whole greater than the parts. Synergetics is a complicated um, topic. Um, also your film takes um, Buckminster Fuller's metaphor of Spaceship Earth as its title. And I know that they um, read his operating manual for Spaceship Earth, which is also shown in the film. And I have grappled with the, the I guess the, the way in which this metaphor of Spaceship Earth likens the earth to a technological object in the sense that it's a spaceship and that we have made it and that we can perhaps junk it or um, have a future off planet without it. Um, and if we can call this kind of techno futurity a genesis myth on its own of, of a kind of new world um, into outer space colonist route, um, I can't help but reflect on Afrofuturist language that was used at, at the time as Alan and, and Brand and Fuller were around. Um, people like Senra and George Clinton who had concepts like the mothership or even of slave ship earth um, and a flight and exodus, not genesis. <laughs> so I guess the utopia is the non-place is a perspective that you have around why you're somewhere and how you got there. Um, so I guess there was so much privilege implicit in the launch of Biosphere 2 and your film goes into that, um, especially as it was conceived of as a surrogate, as you mentioned for Martian um, life or future space colonies. So this privilege of Ed Bass's billions of, of being involved with Alan at all as it is kind of a inside track to being in, in the project and of the all white you know, crew. So what can Biosphere 2 teach us today, I guess, or warn us about the civic project of scientific exploration and access, I guess? Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's a post-colonial analysis to be carried out ar around this story, but also this particular group, which was 
an all white group of straight people. And I think that's also a reflection of the ethos of the back to the land movement in general with, with rare exception. And it, it, the people, this group built a ship and traveled around the world and did projects in kind of indigenous cultures as well. So um, not only were there colonial dimensions to that, to that, that beg to be critiqued, but also the whole premise of colonizing Mars um, is at the root of, of Biosphere 2's aspirations. And I think, um, you know, a lot of what went wrong with Biosphere 2 is that there were no predetermined politics about who was really in charge and how decisions were made. There was a structure like a space crew, but I think um, in, in a sense, the, the synergists and the Biospherians would have said, we're not creating a model society, we're creating um, an instrument to understand the dynamics of planet Earth. But in fact, when you engage in a human experiment and bring a group of people to live under a microscope uh, in, in our media culture with the outside leadership from a kind of, um, you know, uh, CEO type startup figure, um, you inherit much of the power dynamics and, and kind of um, systemic imbalances of the outside world. So if this was a project that aspired to colonize Mars in the future, um, it was in fact carrying the baggage of white supremacy with it and patriarchy. And um, I think in, in a lot of senses, um, the group failed to understand that the project was in some senses a simulation of society because it was they were very focused on the technological and ecological aspects of it as well. But once in the public realm, the interpretation evolved certainly beyond that. Yeah, and a, a, a lot of your film goes into, and I think it's, it's a kind of interesting um, dynamic of them having come out of this pretty scrappy theater slash commune slash agricultural venture of the, um, of the ranch in New Mexico and the way in which their, um, the media circus, I guess, around the launch of Biosphere 2 contributed to its its chaotic ending and probably the most shocking part for me of the film is when Steve Bannon I mean that Steve Bannon of the Breitbart infamy pardoned the pardon days Steve ago Bannon. pardoned by Trump shows up to evict the Biosphere 2 staff from their offices can you just describe what happened in that particular instance <laughs> well Steve Bannon you know Steve Bannon as some people know had stakes in Seinfeld and um, he was actually a partner in a film distribution company that a lot of people know it distributed kind of edgy queer films like Tarnation and stuff back in back in the day but um, he so his his pre um, fascist life is varied but um, you know he worked for Goldman Sachs and as as Biosphere 2's ultimate downfall was the way they managed the media's attention and, and the spectacle they both created that, that lifted them up and tore them down. And their inability to, to speak transparently with the media only stoked further criticism and skepticism of the integrity of its participants and, and creators. And so um, as the project um, was becoming a, a kind of laughing stock and easy target in the media, um, on a pretty grand scale and was continuing to, to hemorrhage costs, um, the viability uh, or the economic sustainability of a project that was designed to last for 100 years was, was not happening. And Steve Bannon worked at um, Goldman Sachs and he specialized in corporate takeovers. And so, you know, so many things in this film are like a metaphor handed to me on a silver platter. And, um, you know, so you have this contemporary political villain who convinced the Trump administration to withdraw from the Paris Climate Agreement, come and literally take over a miniature world. And, and you know, it's obvious like the takeover of Biosphere 2 is analogous to the contemporary villains and, and foes who are taking over Biosphere 1. So um, in, in a sense, um, what I wanted to do and the biggest challenge of the film was not just to end there and the, the kind of... Um, spectacle and, and allegory of that, but to find meaning in the loss of Biosphere 2, um, both um, in a cathartic way for the people who conceived of it, but also in a cautionary way, as I was saying. And I think um, that's always the, the struggle with the documentary is how do you create an end to a story? Stories in real life and real life circumstances don't have logical or coherent conclusions. And so much of the legacy of Biosphere 2 is unresolved. And that's why I'm drawn to it as a kind of forgotten or hidden history. 
Um, but I think um, my editor, David Teague, and I really put a lot of energy into crafting a conclusion that really reflected on ideas about small groups. Um, and the notion that small groups are engines of change. That's something that the biospherian Mark Nelson said. And the idea of this model in which people can realize unprecedented projects in a variety of scales by you know, collecting diverse skills toward a common goal. And um, you know, in, in a lot of ways, despite its shortcomings and its limitations, um, or some of the more kind of nefarious aspects of our, I can't, I don't know the word used, techno geologic, something like that. The, you, you know, I think that there was always an element of idealism and an aspiration to do something that would improve the world. And that, that the kernel of that was people finding coherence of vision and purpose through being in a small group. And so that was kind of where we, we left the story after the, the kind of sensational shock of Steve Bannon's kind of uh, you know, final act appearance. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the theatrical? Um, because some of the images that you showed here and that appear in the film are just pretty wild in terms of the kinds of work that they were doing. And also the way, um, in a, and you talk about these kind of premonitions or these omens of, of their own downfall, they've staged a play before they entered that was about the catastrophe that might happen. <laughs> Metaphors just, on silver yeah. platters, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you have this footage or at least photographs of them you know, un unfolding that. So maybe, you know, to, to speak about what it's like to, to make a film about people who were so filmed. I mean, it was like they were so available to representing themselves and, and that, um, you know, and, and yeah, just you know, theatrical. The, I mean, and the, the title Spaceship Earth is also a nod to Epcot's amusement park ride, Spaceship Earth, and the theatricality of that, that kind of, um, you know, uh, amusement park ride about the future <laughs> and um, with corporate sponsorship. But um, I think that, you know, I make a lot of films about artists, but oftentimes those subjects don't necessarily uh, literally make art. They aren't art makers. So for instance, I made a film called Recorder about a woman named Marion Stokes who recorded television 24 hours a day for 30 years. And I, in some ways I, thought of her as an artist, somebody who, as you said, was world building, um, who created a project on unique and individualized terms that weren't necessarily accessible or coherent from the outside, um, and that had strict kind of parameters and rules um, with an outcome. And that um, so many artists in our culture are not understood in their lifetime. And I really enjoy looking back at cultural material or cultural history or artwork and um, reappraising it and trying to find meaning for it in the present. And so, so many of those variables were certainly at play. Of course, these people were literally artists, but I think in the media spectacle surrounding Biosphere 2, um, they really downplayed that aspect of their background um, because avant-garde theater performers are not typically on Good Morning America. But when you see them on, you know, the Today Show, um, you know, Katie Couric makes fun of the, the kind of Star Trek-like costumes that they're wearing. So there was always this tension between their experimental origins and the theatricality that was just intrinsic to their vision of the world and the desire to be understood and recognized as rigorous scientists and environmentalists and um, to be doing a project that had real business acumen. So those things were at odds with each other, but I think the fundamental ethos of the group is that like many other artists, they were world builders who um, created parameters for their own projects that were unprecedented. Um, and that, you know, from this point of view, before I made the film, it didn't all necessarily add up and fit together. And a lot of my work as a filmmaker is to act as a translator, to find a coherence of vision and continuity across all the varied things they did over half a century, and to show how Biosphere 2 is the synthesis of that inquiry and that knowledge, um, but also to interpret why Biosphere 2 was not appreciated or understood in its time for its uh, on its own terms. So I want to remind the audience um, that you can put questions into the Q and A. Um, I see one now. I'm going to ask one final question myself, and then um, we'll we'll get to those questions. Um, and that is, 
you know, this is a question that I was asked a lot having finished a book, published a book about Black Mountain College. Um, you've kind of answered the why did it end question, which is why people, you know, <laughs> it was so great, why did it end? Um, but then also what, what do you see today is the question that I get a lot. And I guess as having concluded this project, you know, are there sort of tendrils of that that you um, have, have kind of reflected on, I suppose, after this experience of producing the documentary around, um, you know, not that there could ever be something as exceptional as Biosphere 2 in terms of its scope um, and eccentricities, but, um, but maybe just directions in your research that you found yourself moving toward that are related topics. I mean, it's all just fundamental to our shared experience right now. It's obviously when I made this film, I could not have anticipated that this story is a dress rehearsal for our contemporary experience it's in quarantine. So I had to reframe my entire um, understanding and conversation around this film around the pandemic and the quarantine. I mean, the film came out in May at the beginning of the quarantine and the entire meaning and significance and timeliness of the film shifted. It's not something you could expect, but in a lot of ways it was organic to frame the conversation around that or, or to use that as a jumping off point because it was a shared experience. So I think about that more than contemporaneous projects or projects indebted to Biosphere 2. And I think, you know, when I would discuss it and continue to, it's the Biospherians were able to see the consequences of their actions immediately and they could observe and measure them and everything counted. They were responsible for every breath of air they took and every kind of um, ounce of food that they ate. And that sense of collective impact on the world, I think was life transforming for all of them. I know it is because they said so. And that when they entered a larger system, there was a kind of existential dilemma about understanding one's impact and place in this enormous system after being so contained. And so I guess in, in a sense, I, I do wonder how the experience of the Biospherians might um, reflect something in our own encounters as we exit quarantine or the enclosure of this period of the pandemic, because I do expect there will be a personal transformation. I don't expect that the kind of resource depleting narcissism and capitalism of our times will go away. Um, but I wonder if people will be able to model more, more sustainable forms of living, if people through deprivation will um, be satisfied operating in smaller communities and in smaller peer groups or alternative models of family um, and I wonder if people will have a heightened sense of their impact around people and their, the consequences of their actions and how they affect others. And if all of these things might actually change our relationship to the larger world as we enter the, the kind of miniature worlds that we're stuck in now, that's an idealistic way to think about the consequences of what we've experienced. But I think that's the spirit of Biosphere too, a kind of idealism that this model might shift our point of view and our perspective of the larger world we live in. So we have a few questions um, and I'm going to um, give a shout out to Adam Monahan, my former student and his question I'll uh, <laughs> first, which is, or I'll read first. Would you elaborate, um, ask Adam, on Ed Bass's role in the genesis of Biosphere 2? What led him to fund the project? As someone whose capital was built through extractive practices that have contributed to climate change, was he aware of the growing need for an escape from Biosphere One? Yeah, and that's a great question, very well framed. And he was not Elon Musky in terms of like a kind of apocalyptic vision of the future and co coming up with like a one percenters escape plan. Um, but he was like a, a outlier and a weirdo in this kind of oil dynasty. And he was living in New Mexico and he encountered the synergists because they were doing construction work in town. And he actually bought a lifetime membership to the theater of all possibilities, which again, like a metaphor served on a platter. I, and, and he bought this membership to their theater company and became kind of um, engaged in the group and started coming around and performing with them. And the whole idea of building a ship was, uh, I don't know exactly, I can't understand where that idea came from, except how they frame it as we wanted to be planetary people. And they financed that through the money of someone in their group. But once they were on that ship, the aspiration to do projects really took hold. And Ed became, provided the seed money to buy 
property around the world that this group through their sweat equity would improve um, and enhance the value of to do cultural and ecological projects. So Ed became involved in a, in a, on a more modest scale as they were doing these pilot projects, but they were ecological in nature. And I think he was always very driven as um, a philanthropist to support uh, you know, environmental causes. And I think that is ultimately what drew him to Biosphere 2. I think given the, the level of expense, it wasn't philanthropy. He had to justify giving $200 million to an alternative group because, um, you know, because. And um, so this whole model of them making proprietary Mars colonization technology and uh, green technology and licensing and all that, that, I think that was the rationale for doing something that was ultimately out of a, a, a deep kind of fascination and, and passion for environmentalism. He still remains a really significant um, patron of environmentalist causes and research. Um, but of course, I mean, one can only imagine that there's a kind of mea culpa aspect of, of re redistributing wealth acquired from resource extraction. But um, I think it was, it kind of, it snowballed from these small, pro from a theater company in New Mexico to these smaller projects around the world. And I think there, John Allen was a very gregarious person and he found uh, a partner in Ed Bass that empowered his ideas. And, and as uh, Ava was bringing up, I mean, so much of this is the dot-com model. It's at that time, I think it was completely eccentric that a group of out outliers would pursue a project at this scale but that 100% is the model of Silicon Valley is you have a charismatic figure who has a kind of disruptive idea and they find private equity investors who empower them to model that idea. And the goal is to scale up and make billions of dollars and to make the world a better place. And as we see now, that's catastrophic itself. So I think um, what, what he was doing was very much in the space of startup ventures before that existed. But I think what, what drove him was a sense of environmentalist philanthropy that one can only imagine has something to do with the source of his wealth. So there's a logistical question that I think might be in some people's minds who haven't seen the documentary, which is what happened, this is from Andrea, what happened to the biosphere? Is it still standing? Are people ever coming in and out? Yes, Biosphere 2, and the film doesn't get into this, so I, I understand the question. It was sold by C. Bannon to Columbia University who opened it up. It was no longer a closed system um, with a, a, all the biomes mixing together. They were s separated. Um, and people at Columbia did research on coral bleaching as a result of um, CO2 levels. Um, but it was open to the public. They could go inside and then Columbia was kind of done with it and the University of Arizona owns it. and they do kind of, they did a recent experiment uh, in the rainforest biome, uh, subjecting it to high temperatures to understand rainforest um, resilience in, in climate change, as far as I understand. And you can go there and go on a tour. Right now you can even go on a driving, a kind of drive-through tour. But I mean, the, to me, the ultimate failure of Biosphere 2 is not the kind of aspirations of the project, but that this instrument was designed with so much intention to be this, you know, hermetically sealed structure and, and, and it's not being used for that. And people have found value in it, but it's not being used for what it was designed for. So, and, and there's something kind of poignant about it when you visit it, but um, you cannot deny the, the kind of um, Emerald City-like spectacle of, of climbing this mountain in the middle of nowhere and then seeing this spaceship. It looks like a spaceship in, in the desert. Um, there's maybe we'll have time for one or two more questions. Um, Anne Godfrey asks, could you talk more um, about another specific example about how the visual material culture of the Biosphereans was demonstrated or was an expression of their conceptual value system? So I suppose that means what else they did or the visual material culture of the Biosphereans I mean, their system. The I, I think the archival material is extraordinary for this film, and you know, and I go into a lot of archives because it um, is subjective. It's from the point of view of its authors and of the subjects of my film, um, but it's cinematic 
in that it's often filmed from multiple angles, sometimes with cranes. You know, when their boat takes off, there's someone, it's, it's, in, there's intention behind the documentation of it. Um, and then once we go inside the Biosphere 2, um, the, the footage is like data. It, it has a video art aesthetic to it, but all of what they were doing was observing, and not all of what they were doing, but a, a huge focus of their day-to-day -day life was observation and collecting data to understand the, the, the kind of the dynamic, atmospheric dynamics of their system. So what Roy Walford was doing was collecting a kind of data in his video diary that, that I think more than anything documented the human experiment aspect of the project as well. So I think, um, you know, the video art stuff inside, when I first saw it, I was concerned that it was too boring. And I was like, I feel like people are expecting them to all have sex and spit on each other and this footage is not gonna support that goal. But um, in a way it helped me actually understand the experience of being inside, which was much more methodical and meditative, um, labor intensive and boring. You know, one of my favorite shots in the film is all of them lying on this bright purple carpet with orange couches, lounging around listening to a dead can't dance song. And, um, you know, I love those, those moments or just being underwater, um, you know, filming people uh, hitting the glass as, they're, as someone's tending to the coral reef. Or in, in the 16 millimeter footage, my favorite shot is um, travelogue footage of the group running up a staircase that goes to nowhere. I think they were, they were in maybe Aztec ruins. I, I don't even know exactly where it was from, but it was an amazing metaphor of them just running on a staircase that doesn't go anywhere. So um, I don't think necessarily that the way they documented themselves was aesthetically intentional to reflect their value system, but it, it was rich in a rare and maybe once in a lifetime way for me because there was so much metaphorical value in the style of filmmaking that they engaged in. And it provided so many opportunities for us to craft a story in which, you know, what I've come to recognize in this film is filmmakers get how wild the archival is, but viewers, I think are able to take it for granted and forget how wild it is that this is all documented. And, and in a sense, it makes it a real time viewing experience, which I've never, I've never had with a film before. So um, it provided unique opportunities that rarely exist with historical documentaries. And I guess it's a kind of follow-up question that Michael is asking, um, or says the Biospherians document all manner of life inside, and there's a curious balance of straight um, documentation and performance. How were they using this material? Did they release dispatches? And um, was this a proto form of reality TV? Well, it certainly was a proto form of reality TV because it stoked the kind of voyeuristic tendencies of, of audiences. In fact, when Biosphere 2, um, when, when MTV launched the real world, the New York Times headline said MTV's answer to Biosphere 2 and, and obviously um, Big Brother, but also Survivor. There's so many reality TV staples that feel explicitly connected to Biosphere 2. Um, but um, I think they would do satellite uplinks in which there were cameras inside, but it was mostly like interview footage of them speaking to people on the outside or they had the ability to do press interviews inside. Um, but there were no confessional booths like we would see on the real world. I think, I think there was a certain naivete that they were just gonna do their idiosyncratic scientific experiment and tend to their kind of technological garden for a hundred years. Um, and that they, they weren't aware how much people would wanna know about what they're doing inside and who they are. And once people, and when, and when there was resistance to revealing that more explicitly, that's when people really started to turn on the, the project and to question the integrity of a group of people who weren't disclosing that in fact they were artists. So it, it really, I think is the beginning in which people began to expect complete transparency and oversharing. Um, in the nineties, the, the expectation that everybody in the public sphere would overshare their lives was more nascent. And now it's just, um, it's expected that anyone in the public sphere will overshare. And so I think in, in some ways, I hadn't thought of it before, but in some ways the film is a reflection of that shift in our cultural values. Uh, I think we'll do one more question from Susanna Ray. Um, can you both elaborate on the cultural construct of utopianism 
Um, is it an impulse to better the larger universe or an escapist maneuver designed to only better one's immediate circumstances? Um, I mean, my relationship to utopianism is more about idealism. Um, and I, I just never identified as an idealist, but the more films I make, the more I'm realizing that there is a strain of idealism in the work that I do in the projects that I pursue, but also I always recognize um, the dysfunction within idealistic or visionary endeavors. And so when I think about utopianism or utopic impulses, I think there's, um, they're driven by an explicit idealism that is inherently dysfunctional, um, that sometimes can be toxic or abusive or sometimes just might not be sustainable. So to me, it's not about escapism or um, modeling intentional community. It's about trying to do something that hasn't been done before. I really think we need to hold that kernel in our culture for people to try things that haven't been done before and to have the ability to accept those projects for their limitations and to recognize and reflect on them with both um, a certain kind of reverence, but also ambivalence. And at the end of the day, that's my relationship to Biosphere 2. It's an ambivalent relationship, one of super deep respect and admiration for both the people I encountered while making the film, but also the aspirations of the project, but also a recognition of the limitations of it, its failures. And, and I think we need to lean into that kind of ambivalence. So when I think of utopia, um, I have an ambivalent relationship to it. And I think anybody who's thinking cri critically might want to think ambivalently about that word. Yeah, it's something that I think, um, I mean, Frederick Jameson wrote about utopianism is not so much defending this no place or the good place, but to think about the ways in which anti-utopianism is such a virulent aspect of, of conservative ideology in which mm -hmm. controlling the future, you know, and limiting, you know, that, that vision of, of betterment, you know, empowerment um, becomes the end game. So it's not so much about defending utopia as to seeing how the figures that oppose it <laughs> move in the world as agents of, of kind of, you know, constructing limits around our better futures. So in that sense, we all should be utopians. <laughs> well, and risk, risk, aver risk aversion is incredibly conservative. I think people have to take risks. They have to try things that haven't been done before. And when you take risks, it doesn't always work. But I think you're right. It's you, the, the people's cynicism or skepticism of people trying things that are highly idealistic, the kind of snarkiness that often um, I think um, pervades people's perception of utopic aspiration is conservative. And I, I, I really think we have to be open to idealists and, and to, to check our snarkiness. And, and utopia is a place in which people are allowed to, to be naive in that sense. Well, I think that's a perfect place to leave. I don't know if Michael, you want to have yeah, no, final words? Checking our snarkiness is a great <laughs> yeah, Down one, one question that I'm sure um, some people in the audience um, may have is um, for those who haven't seen the film, where, where can they watch the film? Well, um, it's streaming on Hulu. Um, if you have that, or you can rent it from iTunes or Amazon or YouTube, any place you can rent it, you can, you can rent it. It's not, av it's available in territories around the world, but not the entire world. I'm not quite sure where, but I like this website called um, justwatch.com and you can search for titles and select what territory or region you live in. It will tell you the best place to watch it. So if there's people from around the world, that's my hot tip justwatch.com okay thank you it's, it's useful to find anything you know yeah, where, where you can rent it um and i also want to point um people to your fantastic new film um a short film called another hayride that was made in quarantine and that can be viewed on the new york times.com um as an op doc um it's fantastic and um matt is making me feel very unproductive during my <laughs> i made a film <laughs> Well, you're making a magazine. It's not, you know, <laughs> not to be discounted. Thank you. Um, 
Thank you both so much for that fascinating conversation. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Ava. Um, and thank you to our audience for tuning in. Um, and we will have um, additional programming connected to the Utopia issue of the magazine. So if you go to aperture.org, um, you can see what we have coming up. So thank you all again and good night. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs>